Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome, and sorry for the delay. We're running a bit late because we had another film screening and it also got a bit delayed. Um, welcome to this conversation and interesting uh, also the whole evening that uh, follows. Um, this is the last day of uh, Masahat Festival. And as we say in Arabic, uh, which means the, the ending is the best part of it. Uh, so we are very happy to, um, or not the best, but like, uh, yeah, it's difficult to translate, sorry. So no other guests uh, get offended. I'm not a translator. Yeah. <laughs> it ends with a flower. Yes, thank you. Something like this. Uh, my name is Zena Bali, and I'm the managing director of uh, Masahat. And I'm, we are very happy to host this conversation today in collaboration with the uh, Mirage Film Festival, Human International Documentary Film Festival, Frit Ur, and um, Vega Sen. And it's a very fitting conversation to kind of wrap up and end uh, the festival that has been going on for four days, where we had a theme about remembering. And uh, to be honest, when we first started thinking of inviting Gordwa, my first um, uh, incline or like my first interest was to ask Karwa about his time, his memories of Damascus and Homs and all the great conversations and spaces that he created there as a cultural uh, actor, as a filmmaker, as a producer and organizer. Uh, I remember when I was a student at Damascus University, these were the spaces where I used to come where Urwa was um, in 2008 and 2009, where he co-founded uh, the first independent documentary film festival uh, in Syria, Doc's Box. And I remember having a lot of conversations that also continued in 2011. Some of them were very uh, heated and um, very relevant to the, to the upheaval that was happening in Syria at the time. And it was very interesting because being in a dictatorship, it was always these questions about who can tell the story and how much space we have and how much freedom and who can get in and who get excluded were also uh, some of the themes that were running um, in these kind of meetings. So I have a lot of memories that I wanted to talk to Arwa about, but then I realized that in Norway, maybe there are few people who are interested in these kind of conversations and we had to enlarge the scope a bit. And this is maybe part of being in the diaspora and exile that we need to kind of reframe our conversations and reframe the topic. So this, reach, this uh, takes us to the topic of the conversation of today, which is decolonize the gaze. Uh, where, as many of you maybe know, Arwa, since he has become the artistic director of ITFA in 2018, he has been leading a new wave or a new movement uh, in the film festival that has created some waves, I heard, I understood, uh, in Europe and beyond. And for us also as a cultural festival and for many other cultural, uh, I think, institutions in Norway, we think this conversation is very relevant about who tells the story, who gets the power to represent and narrate. Um, so we have a lot of questions for Arwa to hear about his vision and uh, what he has achieved, what he wants to achieve, and to also, of course, open up the discussion with you. So the format of um, today would be that we will invite uh, Arwa to give a short talk, uh, and then he will be joined on stage by um, Anne Schaefer Carlson who is a curator, writer, editor, and educator who has conceived of several exhibitions, publications, seminars, and lecture series. They have a strong interest in artistic and curatorial collaborations, as well as developing the language that surrounds art productions of today. Uh, they is professor, curatorial practice, and currently program director for master curatorial practice at the Faculty of Fine Art, Music, and Design University of Bergen. And after Anne comes on stage, they will also open up the discussion for you. And then we have uh, more time to talk to Arwa outside where we, we, where we will move out to have some finger food and mingling. And then the very last part of the program is to come back here again for some short films. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Arwa Nerabiya on stage. Thank you, Arwa. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you very much and thank you for having me. And uh, a huge thanks to the team of Masahat. Um, you really guys should be proud of what you're doing. You truly do. And if Zena, if Zena remembers being there, 
in these crazy things, times that we did, we did things in Syria back home. Um, she, you should also know that in a big audience, there was always this young woman who I never forget, who would raise her hand like this and stand up and ask the most courageous questions in the most scary contexts and make me feel like, yes, we're doing something that has meaning. So thank you, Zena, also, because you gave meaning. First, I must say that the topic of this encounter here is very big. I do uh, uh, really have the ability to talk about it for the following 24 hours, and I'm going to try to talk for 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, Zena will help me with signs that I have to wrap it up later, but uh, bear with me. It will be a little fragmented, but that to me is a question of methodology. It is not a question of... Uh, um, it's not a coincidence that to me trying to understand such a complexity or to think about such complexity, to me, needs to be fragmented. So I am against defragmenting complexity. To start, I would say, to me, the main question first is, what is art? What is cinema? And what is it that we're talking about when we say the gaze? Personally, just to set what I'm be talking about now, I believe that it is only art when it manages to detach and look from the outside and surprise me with a way of seeing the world that I didn't know when it is going into the procedural details, to me, that is so much more an investigation, that is so much more police work, research work, that can be very important to the world, but if it does not really look from the outside at something and help me see differently, I lose interest. So. This process of creating the image or recreating the image of the world or of reality in an artistic process has been changed, some say, 70 years ago. When somebody proposed a new term, and the term was and still is creative industries. So when we were introduced to the notion of creative industries. We were introduced to the possibility of looking at the creative process as a production line. And when the production line was introduced, it became necessary to have investment and return on investment. And the artwork became a product. Now, this has always been around since ancient times but it never won until 70 years ago. 70 years ago, the term came about, and the whole world of post-World War II started to work on the industrialization of the creative. Now, industrialization here literally means streamlining, finding ways that we can guarantee if we give the artist money, we will make something back at the end. In some cases, what we make back should be money. In some cases, something else. So influence, effect, something that we now call impact. Whether it is that I agree politically and ethically with what is expected and requested or not, that's a different story. But still, this process started to sell art to money, to get money for art, 
we started to think and propose that art and artwork are all pragmatic. So they all have a purpose and the money should come because the purpose is guaranteed. When we do that, we fall into the need to guarantee that this purpose will happen. In order to guarantee, we use workflows. So we start to create simplification. This is the very first essence of Western storytelling that happened in the Greek era, when Aristotle studied the most successful play of his time, that was Oedipus Rex of Sophocles. And he read, wrote a great book analyzing from the outside, not as, a, not as a creative person, but rather as a thinker, what is this play? How does it operate? What is the, fact, the, the, the purpose and the function of its chapters? And how does the drama work in Oedipus Rex? And when he analyzed that play, he said this is why it was successful. Now, the vast majority of film in the world today is still directly to the letter copying the format that Aristotle distilled out of Sophocles' play. Now, this is the core of what we would call now the successful Western dramaturgy. Must be boring because it's been 2,500 years that this has been repeated and repeated again and again. Until today, you would find someone who controls money asking the filmmaker to go work on their project and come back with a clearer three-chapter, three-act structure. Three-act structure is Sophocles, is 500 BC. The other thing to talk about that is also the definition of aesthetics. What is beautiful? It does happen to be Aristotle too. So basically, Aristotle described a frame that is split into six equal uh, um, spaces. It's one line in the middle, two lines vertical. And Aristotle said that the head of the person should be on the second left top of the screen. He was not talking about film. He was talking about painting. But we still consider this to be beautiful images. We still follow what we call the Aristotelian golden rules of composition in today's cinema work. And when we see someone doing exactly what was beautiful in Greece, in Athens, 500 BC, today, we are all ready to say, wow, beautiful. So, this might be a problem, simply because it's too sure. Because the rest of the world did not come from Aristotle. And the fact that it did not, does not make, make it wrong. The aesthetics and the narrative and the understanding of beauty and of structure or architecture, dramaturgy in the rest of the world is different, but it is not wrong. It is not waiting to be taught how to be Aristotelian. The core of this, to go further into this problematic that is causing, in a way that, is, that manifests a lot of problems with regards to our topic, is the question of causality. So, as you know, Aristotle introduced categories. And looking at the world categorized, this leads to the process of how we understand based on causality. As one great filmmaker 
Sergei Loznitsa would say, in film, we understand before as because. Now, when we say before equals because, then the simplification is already saying from one point A to point B, the line is based on because. This causality becomes a limitation. The more we grow as societies, as we think about our world, the more we learn about how fake the system is. Physics knew that for a long time, that it is never such simplified causality, that it is always so much more complex. But when it comes to our reality today, we can see that the main issue with mainstream film, for example, and that happens a lot in documentary film, but also in fiction very commonly, is that it is always propagating the assumption that if you do good, things will be all right. That if you don't do good, things will be shit. But we kind of all know that's not true. We kind of all know that you can work as hell for your entire life and always try your best to be doing good. But you will not be getting that fruit that everybody promised if you study well, if you work hard, you will live well, you will be happy. People will be grateful, everybody will appreciate you. And this simplified causality here is the promise that in some context you can call the American dream. So many films, a whole category, branch of the pigeonholed filmmaking, is what you can call rags to riches. Films about somebody who's poor, oppressed, unhappy, managing to make it and break through, and by the end of the film, it's triumph. Now, for people who have a lot of hope and who are not plagued by cynicism because they do not have options around them, which is the vast majority of people around the world, this is brilliant because, yes, if I now work hard, I can break through. But for the other, for that majority, you know what that says? That actually says, if you fail, it's on you. It's not the system. Look at that person, they made it. They worked hard, they succeeded, they broke through. If you don't break through, you are not doing well. Don't blame the others. <coughs> and I really believe we can blame the others too. It's not always on one person, especially if this person is not in the most privileged part or minority of the world population. Now, I switch quickly, hoping I didn't finish my time already. Seeing other cultures is always coming from this angle. It also is industrialized. So we know, for example, that the history of cinema relies always on somebody showing, is showing me what's happening in another part of the world where people look different, where their problems are different. If you go back to many examples that you have already seen, you will realize that there is, in 99% of the times, a mediator, a person who looks like me, who happens to be there, witnessing what I am witnessing through their eyes. That would usually be Angelina Jolie in Africa. <laughs> and that would be my access to Africa happens always to be through the eyes of Angelina Jolie, because I can easily identify with Angelina Jolie. But I don't want to identify with someone who's African. Maybe because it's painful, or maybe because I'm a racist. Either I'm scared, or I'm racist. It's one of the two. But 
there is always a mediator. Now, this mediator is part of the disaster that we are living through in the world today. The earliest example of this that I know comes from my own culture. The first Indologist, the first person who studied India and its culture was Al-Bayruni, a Persian scientist of the great Arab empire. Al-Bayruni spent 40 years studying Sanskrit, learning Hindu uh, uh, culture and religion, and writing about that. Today, when Indian researchers and scholars and filmmakers try to understand the history of yoga, for example, they cannot do that without going back to Al-Bayruni's records of what was happening in India in the early 11th century. Al-Bayruni wrote a brilliant book that is still a massive reference on Indian history and Indian culture. In his book, he chose, and he theorized for his choice, never to write about politics and never to write about military. It doesn't matter. So Al-Bayruni wrote about culture, religion, social practices, and ignored entirely anything political, anything military. He always defended and wrote beautifully, really, some of the best texts on objectivity. He always described how what he is reporting to us is the literal translation of the Hindu thought. What he is writing is not his opinion. It just happens that his entire relationship with India and Sanskrit was actually because he was always joining the military leader who was attacking India and invading parts of it and to spread Islam into India. And Al-Bayruni, the scientist, was always going with him. It just happens that the only old known colonial text on culture in India was actually by a scientist who rode next to the invader. Now, this to me is to say, history keeps repeating itself. And there is a place to stop doing that. There must be a way that we can think about breaking this cycle. A thousand years later, a great filmmaker, Gianfranco Rosi, who is one of the world's outstanding documentary filmmakers today, went to India with a camera and made his first film in the Ganges River. In the Ganges River, he rode on a boat with a boatman whose job was to move people across the Ganges. A typical very predictable approach of a European filmmaker parachuting somewhere. So, why, 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 every time ask? Around the same time, a great Indian uh, uh, thinker, uh, and that's Homi Baba, try to explain an idea that I find essential in this context, and that is the necessity of accepting unknowability. And this here is about accepting that understanding is overrated, that understanding is a very fake claim, actually. There's something even colonial about the objective of understanding which is about forcing the other to convince me, such as our good filmmaker asking the boatman to, exp to convince him that there is sense to the Hindu system. That goes a couple of thousand years older. That does not really uh, need to prove itself in a way. The 
necessity of accepting unknowability, I think, is essential because it leads to a very important point here, which is how do we approach film? How do we approach the other? Because behind a the film, there's always another. If it is original, if it is not already streamlined, industrialized, and following the same structure of everything else, then the whoever is behind it is other. Approaching the work of another becomes about, am I capable of humility or am I not? Because when I'm approaching the work of another, already knowing that I am the reference and whatever the other is saying here needs to be convincing. I need to be convinced. If you don't convince me, sorry. And this is what I would call colonial gaze here. So in a way, one time I had a very difficult talk at the end of the world with Hugo Chavez fans in front of me. Uh, just really attacking me because all the videos coming out of Syria of people being murdered in the street are actually probably not true. They're probably fake. And I had to say, we don't die so that you believe or don't believe. Your belief is sincerely out of the point. It's deeply irrelevant. You either have the capacity to approach this other and their way of telling a story with humility, or you cannot. And then the question here is not about who has colonial history or who doesn't, who has been colonized or who was not. It is a question of who's a narcissist and who is capable of humility who is capable of listening, of waiting, of accepting that we will not fully understand. But not even that, it's also to accept that I am not entitled to an explanation. I grew up watching films from all over the West. I grew up reading theater and, and uh, 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 literature from all over the world but a lot from the West. When I was a teenager, I thought Sweden was great because that's where I thought Henrik Ibsen came from. <laughs> when I realized he was Norwegian, things changed a bit <laughs> because he comes from the country where that person on the bridge is shouting, the screaming guy on the bridge. And then that only became more complex when I watched the film of Peter Watkins on Munch. And when I found Grieg, Edward Grieg, and when I read the rest of Ibsen, and when I grew a little older and reread Peer Gint, and then when I, had a, when I had my first Norwegian friend, who is a brilliant guy, who was not there to save me, he was my friend. We worked together. We took risk together, we bet on each other in danger. So, one more minute and I'm done. Because I'm late, I know, I know, it's not on her. Uh, one of the most, to me, the most telling examples of my experience discussing this happened four years ago when I was asked to do a, a kind of a, a conversation on stage that I'm not usually a big fan of, which is too uh, opposing, like this kind of high, high uh, polarization. So I, I had a talk with a very interesting photographer, that's Jimmy Nielsen. Jimmy Nielsen is probably one of the most, the highest selling photographers in the world. His specialization is filming um, indigenous peoples and insular communities around the world. And his most famous book that you can buy for, I think, 1,200 euros or something like this is called 
before they pass away, which is actually the whole concept is filming tribes, indigenous tribes, in their uh, uh, folkloric costumes before they disappear. Now, his main work in that book was on Papua New Guinea. And the difference, the, the real paradox there between my experience and the experience of Jimmy, who really is sincere and really believes that what he does is show the beauty. And what he understands his job is to go there and record the beauty of these indigenous people. And it's very difficult for me to explain why that is not just that. But I had to explain that when I was in Syria, in prison, in a detention center under, underground, I came out from that experience after a, lot, a huge international campaign happened to help me from film people. And among these film people who campaigned that I should be let go, released, were colleagues in Papua New Guinea who ran a festival. It is the Papua New Guinea Film Festival. And they made a statement deny, de demanding my freedom. So I had to tell Jimmy Nilsson, this is my Papua New Guinea. It's not the folklore costumes. And I don't know if I ask my Papua New Guinea friends, <laughs> what do they think of your work? Is that Papua New Guinea to them? Or how is their relationship with this image of Papua New Guinea? Did you ask them? Would you like, we were in Amsterdam, would you think it makes sense that somebody comes to Amsterdam now and all they see is people in old traditional costumes and clogs in their feet? <laughs> now, to my surprise, two years later, last year, Jimmy Nelson released his new book on uh, Dutch traditional clothing and folk. <laughs> and actually, his partner in campaigning was the king and the prince of the Netherlands. <laughs> so it all comes together basically because also Jimmy Nielsen, who is still selling very well, he actually grew up traveling the world. That's his connection to the world. He did not uh, grow up in UK, where he's originally from. He grew up traveling the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, with his father, who worked for Shell. So, there is a certain perfect sense to things, I think. I hope this was fragmented enough, <laughs> and that somehow Anna can save me by making sense of all of this mess I made. <laughs>
different places, obviously, but they both hold quite a bit of power, which is interesting. So through practicing different things, we have cared enough about the fields that we practice within, enough to um, take some responsibility, let's say. That's what we're doing, I believe. And as a curator, I'm very happy to have heard the word moderator in your talk today. So maybe we can talk a bit about this role of moderation that also lives in a directorial role, in your case, for one of, or the biggest documentary film festival in the world, which is fairly daunting, I have to say, when I realized, I was like, okay, I've heard about IFA before, I have to admit, but I did not know the scope until I started our research for, or my research for today. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the role that you've taken on within the film festival, because you also act somehow as a moderator. Um, and I know that you have some reflections, um, perhaps, that you would like to share with us. Thank you. And um, to, to me, it is, of course, I, I, uh, ITFA uh, is, is the largest, and I, I would say the most influential film festival in, in the documentary world, at least, but a little more. And I have absolutely no uh, uh, hand in that. It's the exact opposite. I took the job already when ITFA was that, and I'm still scared I might ruin this legacy, so I have to protect it <laughs> to make sure that <laughs> I'm not causing problems. Um, but in a way, yes, ITFA managed somehow with its team, with its founder and the team around her, uh, the founder, um, to become the blueprint, you know, in a way, to propose a way of work, a way of def defining what's a documentary film festival. Uh, in a very successful manner, and also to intrigue an audience that is the largest. So when we say the largest, it's first in terms of number of audience and number of international film people who mm. come. That's, that's what makes it the, the largest. Mm. When I say, I mean, when I uh, try to fight this macho terminology, anything with an EST at the end, um, I surrendered. I ended up accepting largest because it's a uh, 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 size measure. <laughs> it's very uh, uh, technical, mm. as opposed to the best, or, or so on. You know, so at least this, because I don't think there's a best festival. I think the the problem in the world today of film, but I think in of the world, but of film uh, uh, festivals, is that we are losing the the um, the pluralism as much as what we're talking about in film language. So in festivals, we lose the pluralism when no festival has a strong identity and everybody's fighting to be the biggest or the most, the best. And then festivals are fighting for the same films. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, if you attend it, for you've attended all of the festivals mm -hmm. in a way, you know, because that's, that's all the films you have to, to watch. What, what do you want more? Mm -hmm. And to me, this becomes more and more uh, uh, the neoliberal reality of, of the film world today. It means that even the largest festivals uh, and, and uh, film platforms all become a step towards one and uh, top of the pyramid, which is the Oscar. Mm. And I think in Western Europe, in all of the, uh, uh, the setting of uh, a post-World War II Western European extension to cross the Atlantic, you know. So there is a NATO in film, this is what I'm saying. And in the NATO of film, there is one pyramid, it, it has one top, which is the uh, Oscars. And then we end up with European filmmakers feeling worthless if they don't get nominated for the Oscar. Which I think is a massive problem because we need to protect a world that is so much more pluralistic uh, and to measure success mm. in other terms too. Mm. Um, so what do I do here? Uh, I, I try to fight that kind of single pyramid world. So uh, defend a certain pluralism by saying there are different people and they have the right to exist. And in a way, uh, uh, when it comes to direct the question of justice, uh, uh, to me, it was about process. So we, we are faced with a lot of uh, advocacy for quota, 
And I don't think quota is a bad idea. I think quota is a good tactic, but I think quota is also a very cheap trick. Uh, so that's why, to me, I believe in pluralism and sharing the power of decision making so much more than I befear, believe in uh, uh, the quota, pluralistic quota in the output. That's why the team who selects film, at it for, for example, uh, it, it is also technology that's very crucial here because 10 years ago, 15 years ago, in order to be a programmer of ITFA, you needed at least to be able to bike, to use the, your bicycle to get to the office of ITFA, to pick the DVDs of the films you have to watch and assess. Uh, uh, but we don't need that anymore. Hmm. And that enabled me to create a network of about 30 persons of... Uh, 17 countries, so the selectors of ITFA today come from everywhere between uh, Taiwan and Brazil, um, and we, we work together online to make a selection where I am, as you mentioned, uh, the word moderator, where I am, uh, of course I have a vote and I take responsibility for everybody's decision, I'm not walking away from the responsibility, but I'm uh, not the ultimate decision maker. Mm -hmm. So I do, I do believe that a festival of the size of ITFA cannot be representative of my taste. I would not accept that there is a film that I believe should not be there, but that's a different thing. That's not that every film there is exactly my personal taste, otherwise that's not the largest festival in the world in any way, because representation of different sensitivities is important. And. The problem, of course, happens, or the controversy happens, is that when I say we need to have more films from underrepresented regions of the world, there was immediately a response from the overrepresented regions of the world saying, so this means less for us. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I had to say that it's not the same plate necessarily. It doesn't have to be about you. And I think making it about me is the main problem. It's not about me, it's about the other who, who also has a right to be here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, th I agree and I think that um, obviously it's um, my lack of knowledge of your field which makes me very interested in this methodology because also within the curatorial field just for those who might, might be interested. I know it's a very marginal field, but I'm deeply interested myself. <laughs> uh, it is about this um, this misunderstanding of the elite, uh, not of the elite, but of the hero in a way that you're mentioning. That also comes with the with the roles that we inhabit from time to time. So obviously, as we know, film can never be made. Well, it can be made by one person, obviously, but it's much more often a collaboration. And the same goes with uh, with directorships of festivals. The same goes for curators. We can never do anything without artists, then we are not curators, basically. So there's always this relationship that is made that I think is interesting. And it also means that by making that collaboration bigger, it makes something better. I think that's part of also what you're saying, is that by um, fragmenting, let's say, the eyes and the gaze of the festival, having more people look at the program and make it into a cohesive one, that becomes evidently the festival is interesting. But I also wanted to ask about another thing that has to do with maybe, let's call it hardware or methods or you know the way that we produce, because I also read somewhere that you recently have uh, moved into a permanent space in Amsterdam, which gives another kind of responsibility. You are, not, you are no longer only responsible for the temporary audiences of the festival. As we know, festivals appear and then they disappear and then they come back together again, and if you're a dedicated audience, you will, you will meet your friends and colleagues there, and you will have wonderful lives, basically. Uh, but the same thing um, might have to happen now also when you have a permanent space. And I was curious to know more about how you deal with this, the idea of permanence, let's say, that you've kind of brought the festival into, uh, which I think is also your contribution to, and maybe it also is part of what you mentioned, that you didn't want to destroy the legacy. Having a space that people can come to is also a way of safeguarding that, um, let's call it reputation or standing, uh, but it also makes it very local. Well, what you've done methodologically is to kind of disperse the, the gaze, let's say, of the festival to become global, sorry to use the word, but we do live on a planet, um, 
but at the same time, you're, you're kind of creating a local scene where the responsibility is a lot more different, I think. And I, I'm curious to, maybe you could, you just told me before we came into this room about the space itself. So maybe we can start from that, that kind of dis description of the space into launch into uh, your thinking around communities and, and responsibilities um, now that you have a space. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a big question. Yeah, I know. but it's good. We want to know everything. Thank you, please. Thank you. Um, so basically, uh, four or five years ago, we we worked out a concept. To me, I mean, my my angle here is that I um, I, um, I I think the the exceptional contribution of European social democracy comes with a history of supporting arts and culture, uh, state allocations to the topic that are being slushed and destroyed very actively over the past 10, 15 years, worse and worse. But the place, the original design <laughs> that gives labor rights to people who work in this field and that supports uh, uh, a non-commercial understanding of public broadcasting as well as of national film production. These are things that start to be now very theoretical because they are being invaded by conservatism and lower budgets every day. But originally I think there is a great historical example that is inspiring and of, of what this part of the world did about that and failed to develop it further, had to regress from there. And this regression to me is scary and is a lesson. So when, when I look at an institution like ITFA, ITFA uh, uh, is a festival, that's what people know, but ITFA is so many employees. Uh, ITFA is a, a fair, lawful employer. ITFA has huge overheads. ITFA keeps on growing. It doesn't know how to stop growing. And uh, uh, at the same time, it is a question of uh, um, uh, security, sustainability in the, in the financial uh, sense of the word. And to me, all of this says that 11 days do not justify. And when all of this massive institution is working towards 11 days, I think, it works now, but I, don't, I have doubts that it will keep on working in the future. So I think that we had to uh, diversify our offer in a way, to work in different parallel lines. And that was the concept behind the ITFA Institute, mm -hmm. to say that ITFA is an institute that does multiple things, and its, its biggest thing project is the festival in November, but that's mm -hmm. not all of it. It's not a festival that does other things. You know, it's the other way around. And, and when this grew, uh, the city, we, we were looking also for a new office and thinking how to do this, and then the city of Amsterdam said, we have this building that used to be until 14 years ago, the, the film museum of Amsterdam, and, and then the film museum moved to the beautiful building of I, uh, um, and the, the, this building that is, a monument of the city, uh, 125 or 130 years old, in the center of the city, inside the, the famous uh, Vondelpark. So it is a beautiful building in the middle of the city's most beautiful park. Mm -hmm. uh, and the city of Amsterdam wanted it to be, uh, to return to being a public service. So they asked, would you like to do something take it as your offices, but also offer the people of this city something. And we thought this is exactly the real estate translation of our concept. Now, real estate is another, <laughs> another you know, capital uh, question mark, but it is a building that is like, I think, a pro like the, the, the archetype of what you would call a colonial building. And the question becomes, how can you make a truly world, worldly uh, uh, activity within a building that looks 
so scary to anyone who is not privileged. And this kind of building this contrast is kind of the creative challenge or the curatorial challenge that I, I enjoy and try not to fail at, but it's, it's a difficult challenge, yeah. Yeah, because it's not also about, it's not only uh, about what you put in it, but it's also about what people populate the building, obviously. Who is your audiences? And how do you de develop relationships with the people around the park? I first, I just happened to walk through this park and I probably passed this building just a few weeks ago. And it's a very central location. It's, very, it's a very public location. And it's also quite affluent around as far as I could read the signs of real estate and cars in the streets. So it's a very particular part of Amsterdam where you've kind of, um, you're setting root basically. Um, and I'm just wondering how does that, uh, I'm just curious about how you would straddle those two temporalities of permanence and, and temporality of the, um, uh, of the festival. And does it, do you feel that it locates you or dislocates you a bit from what IDFA is doing, which is, I'm just assuming, bringing the whole world into one space for 11 days, as you say, and then dispersing it. I'm not, this might be like a loose end, but I'm still... I think I, I, I really appreciate the question. <laughs> I think it is, uh, I do understand my job as an artistic process and to me that is a political artistic process and in a way the question becomes how can you take this building that anybody would look first and feel like this is not you this actually makes it more interesting. Mm. What can you do with that? Um, because otherwise what? Otherwise we're continuing the ghettoization of society and this building should keep doing what it does. You know, like well-dressed up people meeting in the fancy building in the city center and we go do our poor people stuff on the outskirts in poor buildings. Boring too ghettoized. I think it's really interesting to break this cycle by the, the, the actual language we use, the choices, curatorial choices that we make. Because I do believe, like, whenever somebody mentions those three terrible words, words I, I'm, uh, as you already know, I have word problems. Uh, so <laughs> diversity, equity, too. and inclusion, I think, is a great, uh, um, a great, uh, example of industrialization of uh, how immediately something that started as political became an industry on its own and it makes a lot of people a lot of money now and it doesn't really help anyone much uh, but to me this is the question when you want to reach really global cities global villages like Amsterdam or Oslo the whole world is here so how do you approach the pluralism of the city? To me, it is by representing the world. Because it's two uh, 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 circles looking at, staring at each other. If we are representing the whole world, then our own city is whole represented and connected. It's not direct, but it shouldn't be. Because otherwise we start saying we do an Arab film festival to target the Arabs of the city and then let's do an Indian film festival to target the Indians. How about the closer things? You know, like Iranian film festival only for Iranians and it's, it becomes really a very closed world. Where were we? I'm sorry. Anna. I don't know. I'm just thinking of how production and, and artistic output always is connected somehow. And that the how is always connected to the who and partnerships. The, always collaboration and um, yeah. so I think that we have yeah I think somehow we just met an hour ago and we find some common geekiness about how you do things with more people and in what way and for what and why and I think that that's something that I see as um, that's why I'm probing this kind of more infrastructural part of the festival because I think it is important how we make things happen and not only you know what happens because it's easy to make a facade but it's a lot more different to make 
sustainable changes that will last, outlast you. I understand you in your second period of a directorship that might, I don't know how the system is, but in Norway you generally get two and then you're out. Uh, so it is also about leaving a trace that is um, there for someone else to build on and for them to hopefully bring further uh, the ideas that you've, uh, I don't know, the, the seeds you've sown, let's say, within this quite massive institution. Um, I wanted maybe to, I don't know what time, how do we do for time? Ah, okay. I just wanted to uh, share with you, this is going to be fragmented because I just follow suit basically. <laughs> um, whatever you do, I'll do. Um, but I just wanted to share with you guys because you might not be aware uh, of the wonderful poetry that can come out of this person. Uh, because I read a text that you uh, wrote a while back. <laughs> And I wanted to, to bring this quote forward. It is something that is describing a situation that is not uh, perfectly uh, wonderful, which is how documentary filmmakers are persecuted, killed, and exiled. Uh, but the framing of this, um, uh, of this statement is so beautiful that I wanted to share it with you. And it is not everywhere in the same way, but everywhere in one way or another. And I think that's such a beautiful way of looking at also a festival because it's not the same, but it's everywhere in one way or another. And I think that this is also, from what I understand from our brief conversation, this, this kind of constant fight against some kind of hegemony and some kind of majority and to, to try to level out something is, I think, evident in the sentence, which is very beautiful and kind of fun with the words as well. You said you care about words, as do I. Um, and I think it also brings uh, something to the topic that we've asked to discuss today, which I think is um, evident. Um, and I hope to frame it somehow within a methodology rather than representation, which I, I care very deeply about. Um, but I wanted to maybe uh, end by asking um, what the future plans for the festival is, not for the space, but for the festival. How do you bring the everywhere together um, and show that that's different. Uh, d d d this is, again, the, exactly the first idea I started from, which is I work against myself. So, uh, it's, a, it's a bit de deconstructionist in a way. That to me, it is w when I disagree with someone, with a film, when I go in the direction this way, I immediately realize that I need to go this way too. And I keep, keep intentionally, consciously complexifying. So in a way, if I'm afraid of my ignorance about something, I walk directly to it. And this way it becomes more of a st stronger, let's say dialectic, although it's not the right word here, but anyway. Uh, uh, so what's the future plan? Um, I've been actively bringing together the poorest, less, least privileged filmmakers of the world, many of whom has never left their own city in their life, but they are true talents, true, true hardworking people who enrich the world next to the biggest Hollywood executives in the same, on the same table. And no, they will never reconcile. That's not the point. My project is not to get, not to sell the talented Sierra Leone filmmaker to the uh, superstar Hollywood executive. I think that's not useful. What's useful is that they are in the same room. Mm. Agreed. Is, to, to me, that's because in a way this all is about, again, narcissism versus humility. And what do I know? I mean, we talked a lot. I think we reached, in, 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 in good parts of the world, we reached a consensus about mansplaining. You know that uh, you can't explain feminism to women, man. I agree, but I did take this lesson way bigger. 
So it's not just that. So there's something here that's not convincing to me about curatorial practices. So what? It's not me who is the expert, it's you, Anna. <laughs> so in a way, to me, I might not be on the same page, but I, I have to accept to give you the space because that's, and to try and learn. And maybe in a few years time of standing aside when you are doing the thing you should be doing, maybe then I might earn the right to have an opinion and discuss, but otherwise I should only have questions. And I truly believe in that. This is to me the, the, the decolonial point, is to take out the colonial, and the colonial is, uh, mansplaining is a colonial practice. So when I say colonial, I don't mean just simply Britain, France, Spain, Netherlands, and all the others. I, I mean all of this practice of dominating the right of the other. Well, I mean, we sit in a colonial state right now, so I think those are wise words. But I also think that the, the idea of making gathering practices for people to come together, for those um, ideas to be shared more, is uh, something quite fruitful. And uh, hopefully you will join me in uh, some kind of capacities at the latest stage. Yeah, yeah. we meet in Fonten Park in Amsterdam. Perfect, let's when go for a walk. By, you stop by. And... <laughs> I will most definitely stop by, <laughs> um, not in very soon, I hope. Um, we do, maybe, do we have time for any questions? We have three minutes to e evacuate this room, so maybe not. There is one question. Do we have a microphone? Yes, we have one here. I'm not sure if it's on. Oh. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to say super thank you to you and your amazing reflection and that you're an amazing also storyteller. This is what we heard right now. Um, so much of the, actually, the Western art as you also is the kind of a, the gaze, the male gaze. Like what we see of the, is not only the colonization, but also the male gaze. But, and now when I'm hearing you, you seem like a revolutionary man that wants to revolutionize something amazing and do a, a really great job in a space that doesn't want to be necessarily revolutionized. Um, what I mean is like a lot of institutions, film institutions and filmmakers from the region, from different parts uh, in Europe, that are against what you're doing because they will not have a space to screen their films, they will not get the quota. Um, and uh, often, uh, and this is I hear very much, that people are opposing what you're doing, and filmmakers very much, and they're referring to it as what the film that's coming in from the other part of the world as bad cinema, bad art, uh, bad uh, craft. Um, uh, and then the question is, if you're fighting for this beautiful mission, but you're not having the big, big crowd fighting with you. So I wonder, uh, do you believe we can make this happen, like win, uh, and make this shift, and then what is your strategy to actually make this survive? Sorry. Thank you, Rasha. This is a beautiful question. When we started Docbox in Damascus, Diana El Jeroudi, my partner, and I, the first article, the first article written about it had the title Fighting Windmills. It was very clearly a Don Quixotean thing that we were trying to do. You heard Zena tell you about her experience with Docsbox. That's enough for me. We took part in the uh, Syrian revolution. What's more Don Quixotean than that? 
I am very proud of that. So, thank you, but no, I don't care about results, and I don't want a return on investment. And this is part of our intercultural exchange, <laughs> is that somebody here is coming to say, yeah, I'm not here to win. I'm here because it happened and I'm here. And honestly, it's very rare and I will forever, forever be very respectful of ITFA's team for hiring someone like this. Because I know this was crazy. So, yeah, I can tell you there are some people who feel alienated by what we're doing as much as there are men who think Me Too is very dangerous because any woman can ruin your life with one lie. But there are also a huge number of people who suddenly started to feel that they have uh, uh, that, that they are welcome. And they were never welcome before. So uh, I think, again, the question is, can we all have this exercise of humility? One, one, one last example I find, to me, it's, it's very uh, iconic in my own way of thinking about this, is this year the guest of honor of ITFA, every year there's a guest of honor of ITFA, that's a very big deal in our program structure. And the guest of honor is Wang Bing. Wang Bing is, is the most celebrated Chinese documentary filmmaker uh, in the past 20 years. Five, six years ago, he made an eight hours and a half film with the title Dead Souls. Dead Souls, Wang Bing worked over years secretly on recording testimonies of the survivors who were still alive back then in their 90s, the survivors of Mao Zedong re-education camps. And that's a part of China's history that nobody, that was deleted. And when he secretly filmed these testimonies for years, he ended up making this eight hours massive work. I watched it in its premiere. It was celebrated in Cannes, the most prestigious film festival in the world. And I came out shaken by this thing I witnessed. And then a very famous Western filmmaker comes to me so angry and says, do they not fucking know what editing is in China? And they were right, because if you give the eight hours and a half film that will become part of history of China forever to a Western uh, 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 machine of film, it will be seen as footage, and it will be edited into three acts, and it will become less than two hours, and it will be so much more punchy. And it's enough, I will get all the information. So why eight hours and a half? I don't know, when I, when I screened the film, an audience member asked Wang Bing, did it have to be eight hours? After eight hours, so the person watched the film. And the answer was back, well, of Wang Bing was, just to return to the point of un un accepting unknowability, the answer of Wang Bing was simply, you are the audience, you are thousands, I am but one person, and I have my dignity, I will not answer you. So, to me, when I look at it, I can try to guess. I think looking at such sacred experience, he ended up giving this sanctity to every silence, and he believed that I have to spend eight hours if I'm really going to experience this. But it would have made so much more money if it was two hours and three acts. That's true. It would have been a hit. It just became an anecdote of what film festivals have the courage to show an eight hours and a half film. Certainly nobody would release it in cinemas, nobody would show it on TV. But 
it doesn't change the fact that this film will remain part of the future of, uh, of China forever. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.